I'm here to talk to you about the future of citizen science. But before I do that, I'll have to talk with you a little bit about two things that not that many people know about, the microbiome and citizen science. So I run a project called Ubiome, where we sequence the human microbiome using citizen science. So, oops, not that one. So uh, let me tell you a little bit first about the microbiome. So, the microbiome are the trillions of bacteria that live on and in all of us. It's amazing. There are 10 times as many bacteria on our bodies and in our bodies than there are human cells, and over 300 times more genes, which means that we're basically more bacterial than we are human. We're basically an ecosystem of organisms that live on our bodies and can tell us a lot about ourselves. So, Listed on this slide are, dozen, are some of the dozens of conditions that are correlated with the human microbiome. They're everything, you, everything from autism to anxiety to acne, that's just the A's, <laughs> to depression, to bowel conditions, sort of everything you could possibly imagine. And there's a different microbiome on every ecological niche in your body, from the niche in between your toes to the niche on top of your feet, inside your nose, your mouth, your gut, every part of your body. So these bacteria that live in these different parts of our body can help us learn about ourselves because they're fellow travelers on this journey with us and they, they live in basically our internal environment. So as I um, started to explore this, we started a citizen pro science project to tell people about this. Um, I started to get some interesting feedback from people who were wondering what we were doing. And what they were talking with us about were about providers, payers, and patients. I know this isn't as prevalent as Europe as it is in the United States, but the idea that science is made up of providers, which are doctors and healthcare professionals, payers, who are insurance companies, or in most of Europe, the state, and patients, who are all of us. And we're all sort of stuck in these roles of one of these P's and unable to move outside of it and to think of ourselves as what we really are, which are people who have thoughts about our own health, who have data to contribute, who have ideas to add to the scientific process around our health. So, as Einstein said, science is a refinement of everyday thinking. And science is often trapped in a lab. Think about it, if you want to be just a person rather than a patient or a provider or a payer, you really have no access to the kind of data that you need. Journal articles are trapped in the lab, uh, or, sorry, are trapped on the web behind a paywall and you can't access them. Uh, the latest technologies are trapped in a lab and you don't have access to be able to use them directly. And doctors think you're really annoying when you ask them lots of questions about things that you learned about when you were on Google. So what we decided to do was to use citizen science to allow the public to participate in science. And this is basically crowdsourcing. We've seen crowdsourcing in so many other fields other than science, but why not apply it to something as fundamental and important and meaningful as science? So, in the US anyways, the average age of investigators, principal investigators, scientists who do research, is 46 years, and the first time researchers are 41 years. So think about it, you have to go from elementary school, middle school, high school, graduates, you know, undergraduate, graduate school, become a professor, and then maybe you can just, maybe then you'll get a grant that will allow you to investigate something that you're curious about. There's so much training that goes from one end to the other. It's almost like a priesthood. And in the world right now, because of this, there are only 5.8 million scientists, according to the AAAS in the US. But think about it, there are half a billion college-educated people in the world. And, okay, maybe being college-educated isn't the perfect measure of whether or not you have the capacity to be involved in science, but let's just take that as a rough measure. So out of 7 billion people, we have 5.8 million scientists. But what if we had half a billion scientists, or even more? What if all of us could be involved in science? So let's think outside the current system. Think about all the things that science has brought us over the past, let's just restrict it to the past 150 years. So, all the drugs that have been created, all of the discoveries that have been made, and all the problems that we face in the world. Climate change, you know, diseases, there's also everything that science can help us to address. And what if we had more minds and more effort put into solving those problems? So, this is an example of what we did, which is where I think citizen science can go, and where I, I know that it will go over the next 
10 years. I think we'll live in a very different world 10 years from now. So we did a crowdfunding campaign on a platform called Indiegogo. We were just three people, <laughs> no institutional support, no funding from anybody. And we raised $350,000 in crowdfunding and got over 3,000 participants, three, uh, over 3,500 participants from 40 different countries to build the largest microbiome data set in the world, entirely funded by the public, no grant money involved, entirely driven by people who just wanted to learn more about their microbiome. And what's really interesting about this is that this is totally outside the traditional scientific paradigm, which is basically you, get a you, you think up an idea, you get a grant, then you study something with a fairly small number of people, usually just a few hundred people, and then you apply that as if it applies to everyone else in the world. This is a totally different way of looking at science. So how did, how did, we get, how did I get involved in this, and how did we do this? So this is our current team now. We have five people now. And my background is not, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm a computational social science. My background is in studying how scientific and technological systems can change society. And when I started to learn about citizen science, I just thought, well, this is amazing. Why aren't more people involved in science? Why can't more people experience these benefits? And we put together this crowdfunding campaign and, and it turned into something amazing. So let me tell you a little bit more about how it works. So what we do is we give people access to cutting-edge scientific technology by basically packaging it so it's easy for the public to use. So in the lab, we use Illumina state-of-the-art DNA sequencing machines. We have proprietary technology. We let you learn more. We have bioinformatics. They're state-of-the-art. But for the user, it's very simple. It's just a very simple collection kit. It's really inexpensive. Um, it's, we use, uh, there's a health survey that people answer, and then you can learn how you correlate with other people about the microbiome. And we make it easy for the user to have access to this cutting edge science. You don't have to be in the lab, you don't have to know anything more about it except what you want to know about it and what you can bring to the scientific process in terms of your own questions. So what's different about, uh, about Ubiome as a citizen science project is that we want to involve people not just as data collectors and not just as you know, submitting their samples to us, but we also want them involved on the level of submitting their questions and ideas and hypotheses. So they're things we all notice about ourselves and these correlations that we notice in our everyday lives. But right now, there's no outlet for them. I was just talking with someone last night at dinner who said that he noticed a correlation between some mental illness in his family and use of antibiotics. Now, if you go to your doctor with that, they have no idea what to do with that. But when you get together with other people who may also have noticed that correlation, and you collect rigorous data, and it's all in a format where it can be commensurated, well, then it starts to become science. And then we can all become citizen scientists. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the advantages for science and for the public of citizen science. So for science, it's pretty clear there are some tremendous advantages. There's a larger sample size. So the, the average size of, of studies around the microbiome is just a few hundred people. The uh, NIH in the United States did a $173 million project that studied 250 people. And our project that was only, is 10 times bigger than that. It's not that we're so great and that their project wasn't valuable, but we can build on these huge public, public projects with private projects, crowdfunded projects that are even bigger. So I think larger sample sizes will just start to become the norm because it's just possible with the internet to have more people. And I think the data will be higher quality because people actually care about the results. Right now, if you participate in a study, you're a research subject <laughs> and you're compliant with the terms of the study. And you don't necessarily have any stake in the output because you don't get to see your data. I was talking with someone the other day who was telling us that you know, subjects are starting to ask in research studies, OK, so when do I get my data? And the answer is, what? You never get your data. You get your data. But this is a totally different paradigm now that people can actually get their data in a study. I think there'll be a huge change to the research agenda also in terms of what, what gets studied. Because right now, the research agenda is set entirely by experts, not by the crowd. But the prospect of citizen science is that you have questions about science, scientific questions. Uh, questions around your health and biomedical research, questions and other kinds of research. And you can drive that scientific agenda and really make, make a change, really have the things that you care about studied. And then there's the whole idea of translational medicine, which is the idea that 
research goes, off in the, goes on in the scientific lab, and then slowly, over time, it gets translated into clinical practice. But this can be sped up tremendously because you are the subjects of clinical practice. So what, you, what your concerns and questions are, if those become part of the research agenda, translating that into clinical practice isn't really necessary because you're part of that process. You're no longer just a patient, you're a person involved in it, contributing your knowledge and thoughts and hypotheses in the process. So I think for the public, this has some tremendous benefits too. The idea that your data is yours and that you have agency and own it. You can, tr you can share it with other types of data. You can mash it up with other, other scientific studies, with other services that you use, with quantified self. We'll hear a little bit more about that later today. You, can, you control it, so you're in charge of your data rather than the system that just extracts data from you. So there's the whole idea of patient empowerment of patients that have diseases that are not often studied because there are not very many people have them, or diseases where, that are very complex and that aren't being currently very, very well served. Well, patients can be empowered by this and to actually study the things that they want to study about their health concerns. And public engagement of science, which is always sort of this like, sad part of, <laughs> of, sci of the scientific community where you have these people off in the corner who are wondering, you know, how exactly are we going to get the public to care about science? And maybe this isn't an issue in Belgium, but certainly in the US, people don't even realize that you know, the Earth goes around the sun. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a lot of uh, lack of scientific literacy in the US. And I think part of that is because people aren't involved in science. Science is this spectator sport that you just watch. So why would you be involved? But if you are allowed to contribute to science and to have your personal questions generate scientific questions that other people answer, then maybe you'd be more involved. And maybe STEM education, that's science, technology, engineering, and math, would be much more personally meaningful because you're doing things that you actually care about. So what does this lead to? All of this leads to a world where science is a part of everyday life, where science is no longer something that people just watch other people do, but science is something that we all do. So it leads to a world where there are solutions to problems that are generated much more quickly than they could be in a world where there are only around six, six million scientists rather than half a billion scientists. And if you're involved in an organization that wants to involve the public in science, citizen science is the way to involve the public directly in that and to expand the reach of just about anything that scientists do. So let's all become scientists together. <laughs>